Good afternoon, all of you. Enjoy your meal. It is, my name is Peter Juven. I'm Dean of the Faculty at CMC here, and it is my great uh, pleasure and privilege to introduce Professor Margie Charlop, the winner of the third Faculty Research Award and our speaker for today. So, a few words about Marjorie before she starts her talk. So Margie Charlop is PhD and BCBA. I went to look that up. It means Board Certified Behavior Analyst um, and has enjoyed a long and distinguished career helping children with autism and their families through both research and treatment. She's a professor of psychology at, in the Department of Psychology at CMC uh, and since a long time the director of the Autism Center her renowned Center for Research and Treatment of Children with Autism Spectrum Disorder and their families. She's a licensed psychologist and maintains also a private practice and consultation service. So Margie has literally made hundreds of presentations in her area throughout the world, given keynote speeches, uh, workshops and lectures throughout the globe. She has published tens of articles and multiple books and is one of the top authorities in her field. Uh, her most recent book is called Play and Social Skills for Children with Autism Spectrum Disorder. Um, and she's also the author of, uh, amongst others, by the way, many others, uh, Naturalistic and Incidental Teaching, which is now in its second edition and which is a classic in her field. Her research focuses on communication, motivation, social skills, behavior problems, and parent collaboration in education. She has crafted several widely used treatment protocols, such as video modeling, and she is known to use everyday technology to enhance learning. Through the Autism Center, she has changed not only the lives of the children who go there and, and the families who have benefited from it, but also created enormously powerful experiences for our undergraduate students. I was just talking to some of them at my table who have worked since years at the Autism Center, it is an amazing opportunity for the students themselves too, to learn much about, about themselves, frankly, about psychology, about research, and, and so on. So the, the Autism Center works on many levels. It provides great services to the, to the children who get excellent treatment there. It's a, it's a laboratory for learning for our students and students from uh, across the, the, the consortium. And obviously it's the resource that Margie builds on to do the research and the publications that change her field. So I repeat, Margie Charlop is the recipient of the 2018-19 CMC Faculty Scholarship Award. Please join me in congratulating her and enjoy your talk. Thank you, Peter. Is this on now? Great, I probably don't even need it. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming today. It's a pleasure to see you all, a great audience. And um, I've been here for 35 years and I had the distinct pleasure today to sit next to the man who hired me 35 years ago and that's former president Jack Stark. So um, we were reminiscing, he was reminding me of all the um, different types of procedures that were developed here at CMC in the Claremont Autism Center. I'm going to give you a little brief tour through what we have done in our clinical research. But first, let's see if I could figure out how to use this. Um, I'd like you to look around. And uh, there are a little over 100 people in this room. And if you don't know someone with autism, spectrum disorder, you will. If you have a family member with autism, that's quite likely. So uh, this is, hi Kathy, this is a problem that um, is here to say, and let's see if I can use this, and it's not going away. So we need to address this. So if you think about it, Autism occurs in one out of every 59 births. It's highly prevalent. And as I said, if you don't know someone with autism, you will. What's happening with the prevalence of autism? 
we had a little bit, let's see if I can find the red thing, here it is. We had a little bit of a plateau between 2014 and 2017, and now it's skyrocketing again. So while geneticists and biologists are doing work to find out what causes autism and if we can do something to stop it from occurring, we have a large number of persons who are here living with autism, living in their families, uh, on the spectrum, and there's a wide range or huge heterogeneity of autism ranging from children and adults now who would be considered on the lower end of the spectrum and those on the higher end of the spectrum. So many individuals with autism can function quite well in society and maybe they're sitting amongst you in college doing wonderful things, but the majority of them are not. They are having a great deal, right? There we go, of difficulty functioning. According to the latest diagnostic statistical manual, the definition of autism spectrum disorder is deficits in communication, social communication, and social interaction. The other main cluster of symptoms is repetitive and restrictive behaviors, interests, or activities. Now, these are two large categories, and they certainly do not describe a child with autism. So, when it says deficits in communication, we are dealing with children who cannot utter a word. Two children who maybe can have a conversation, but it might only be about maps in Orange County, or cactuses, or um, dinosaurs. And I'm not making these up. These are actual topics that some of my clients have loved to talk about. Um, repetitive and restrictive behaviors might consist of a child just looking at a Honda catalog over and over again, or flapping their hands. So the severity of these kids, there's a huge range. So we need to find out the best treatments for them, and we need to do it scientifically. But we also need to take a lot of other factors into consideration. Jenna, I think I'm on a roll now, so I'm gonna need a five minute warning when it's like a half an hour. Can you do that for me? Okay, I forgot to set my timer. Uh, where are we now? Okay, so our big issue today is my intro students know I just get going and whoops, don't know when to stop. We need to somehow bridge the gap between science and service. And basically, that's what we've been doing for these past 35 years, Jack. We've been trying to bridge the gap between science and service. So we're learning how to treat these kids, and we're taking data, and we're trying to find out the best ways in our clinical research. But we need to bridge this gap. So I'm going to talk to you about a couple of ways that we can do this because we're not always getting there. The first way that we need to bridge the gap or that will help us bridge the gap is for us to know our client. We need to know the child that we are working with. So we can't just go off into that beautiful psych psychology building that we have. That's a joke, everyone. <laughs> you may laugh. The psych members are laughing and sit in our ivory tower and think, what can we do about autism? We need to interact with the children. We need to get to know what they do. So at first, most of us were going out there and trying to just do lessons with them over and over and over again. But if you look at them and if you interact with these kids, the majority of them are visual learners. They told us that. 
The children told us that. So when we try to say to them, repeat after me, hold up a cookie, say, I want cookie, maybe they would say, say, I want cookie. But they weren't really understanding what was going on. And they didn't know how to go from there. So we decided that we needed to change our treatment procedures and provide visual strategies for them because that's how they learn. And quite frankly, many of us learn visually. I know that my millennials and I know my intro students can read icons so fast, they can read a page of icons because they're used to it um, faster than I even can read one icon. They've been trained that way. You should see children with autism. They can pick up an iPad and they could go and find some cartoon or YouTube. They are visual learners, but they don't understand a word that we might say to them. Now, I'm generalizing, of course. So we started to develop visual strategies. And one visual strategy, Peter mentioned this in the intro, was video modeling. So we can show and demonstrate to the children what we want them to learn. We can tell them, but if we display it on a screen, they will learn it. So back in 1989, when many of you were not even born, right intro students? Yeah. I thought so. Uh, we came up with this procedure called video modeling. That was the first study. Let's see if this will work. This is just a very brief clip of teaching a child how to manipulate a toy. What do I press? Just press press. Now it's slow and exaggerated and you're probably thinking, oh, the child is going to be bored watching this. But they weren't. And now there are hundreds and hundreds of publications based on video modeling. Okay. I wouldn't do a presentation without throwing in some data for you. So I have a couple of um, figures to show you about data. How are we doing on time? Hmm. Okay, this is not based on the video that I showed you. This is actually Kevin McPherson's uh, senior thesis. He's a former CMC student, and this is from his publication. So um, we published his senior thesis, and he did a very interesting study. On an iPad, he created a video for, you always see us out there doing our kickball games and our social skills uh, research. So embedded in that uh, kickball game, Kevin McPherson, um, as you can see in baseline, looked at whether or not any of the kids, these are different kids, there are five of them, this is behavioral research. It's very different from the group design that most of you are used to. So in behavioral research, we use the child as their own control, and then we stagger when we implement the treatment. So as you can see during baseline, the children did not provide any compliments or any verbalizations to each other. They just played, ran around, and didn't really socially interact. So Kevin, for his thesis, decided to make some videos of verbalizations and a gesture. You know, this is supposed to be good job. Uh, good job, I know this is a little old-fashioned, high five. 
but the verbalization was, good job, great kick, way to go. And uh, that's upon presentation of the video right there. And as you can see, all the kids learned to engage in that behavior, some of them rather quickly. So after a long baseline, they did pretty well. So when you've all heard the expression, a picture is worth a thousand words, a video is worth a million words. Now this is a very important figure. It's a bar graph. Oops, I boo-booed, sorry. Okay, so here's baseline. We don't have anything because I didn't say anything. Now here, after intervention and during intervention, we have varied verbalizations, and that is, did they just mimic what the video showed them, or did they modify and come up with their own verbalization? And this is called response generalization, and this is what we really want. Can they now go from here and say something novel? So we have unscripted, scripted, and varied. So this is varied, but close to the script. Right here, this thin little line, this reminds me of an ice cream sandwich for some reason. I didn't have the bread pudding for dessert. Um, and then this is completely unscripted. So as you can see, for most of the kids, we have a lot of unscripted compliments coming out of these kids. This is a very potent procedure. We have to make sure that providers are using videos and catering them to the individual child. I've gotten requests often, can you sell me your videos? I could have made a lot of money and just quit this job. But we don't, first of all, we don't go into education for the money, right? Second, the dean saying, yeah, that's right. And, <laughs> and second, that's not how we roll. Research in clinical research has to be focused on the individual child. Okay, the first thing I say to my intro class or any class, any lecture class I'm teaching is what, Mo? Mo's falling asleep. Wake up, Mo. What do I say first? in intro, turn off your what? Cell phones. His friend is covering for him. <laughs> I also say don't fall asleep in class. Um, yeah, but can cell phones be used as a technology to help the kids? If you think about it, every family has a cell phone. So, since children with autism are visual learners, we have gotten pretty far in teaching them. We usually do something like this. Write out a script in a play situation. Let's make a big tower with blocks. And then show it to the child and have them read it to their friend. But can you imagine, and we do this because we have children, if we tell them what to say, they get confused. Do I imitate you? Who do I imitate? Then we have to erase it and write the next line. It's cumbersome, but look, we have to hold up a whiteboard. That won't fly in the natural environment, so, we designed this procedure, and Julia Blanco, some of you may know her, uh, she expanded upon this for her senior thesis. And what we did is we put cell phones by the kids. If they had their own cell phone, we used their own cell phone. If they didn't, we used their parents' cell phones. Then we had Research assistants sit a ways, and we texted in their line of a script. Do you want to play? 
let's make a block tower, and they would read what was in on the cell phone and then say to their friend, let's make a tower. And then we faded it out. So here's one kid's, here's one example, I, give me. So each line would be different depending on what was going on in the play activity with the two kids. Let me see if I can find Okay. Here's a nice video. Cool. Do you like looking at them? This is Brian. So cool. Anything else you like doing with them? Do you like building with them? You like building with them like this? Do you like to build with them? That was baseline. You didn't hear anything. I'm good. I'm texting him. Let's make a tower. Sure. Brian, do you want me? Do you want to get that red block? Brian. The cell phone is out of reach now. And the call is one. What's your favorite food? That's cell phones are gone now. McCall, can you play with blocks with me? Sure. Yeah. Which block do you want? Brian, what block do you want? What's, what's up, Danya? I'm doing good. What's up, Ryan? Are you happy today? I'm happy today. Nice. Should we play with toys? I can play with toys. So there's a huge change in Brian. You saw him. Now, we had to shape him up to learn how to use the cell phone and look at it with a few prompts, but it didn't take that long. Huge change in his interaction with a variety of different peers. And so we're really excited about this new line of research. And um, everybody has a cell phone. This, the precursor to this study was published and it was one of the top downloaded articles for that year. So we're very proud of our Julia. I brought something else in to show you that we're doing some research on because the children are so visually oriented. And that is teaching the children to speak using pictures. So this is the typical, I don't know if you can see this, this is the typical way that we teach new uh, communicators to speak if they can't learn verbally. And it's just a card, I want popcorn. And they have to get these cards to express themselves. They have to go, they have a book, they paste it on, and they say, I want popcorn. And then that's it. That's all they do. But we're doing something, and there's my students, there are my students who are working on this. We decided to jazz up their speech, and then of course, fade it out so they don't have to rely on this. So we teach the kids to say, I want to eat two big chips. That's a much more sophisticated phrase than, I want chip. And then we fade them out. We have the chips over there. I want to eat two big chips at five minutes. Fade it out, fade it out. So the other day, child comes in. He always steals my Collins watermelon. He sees me eating the watermelon and uh, he looks at it and he says, watermelon, which is great for him because a year ago he didn't talk at all. But we're kind of sticklers for speech. So I said, I always say to these kids who can talk now, I'm not giving you anything until you use a full sentence. So he said, 
I want watermelon. And that wasn't enough for me, because I know he can do better. So he went into the room, he came back out, and he said, I want red watermelon, please. And then I gave him a big piece of my watermelon. He eats my lunch every Thursday. <laughs> it's OK. That's where, that's where the Collins money is going. <laughs> Something else that we learned, and I only have five more minutes, so I'm going to make this part a little short. We learned another way that we need to bridge the gap between science and service is that our stakeholders, and I'm going to mention that in a minute, um, and Jack pointed up, he said, weren't you the one who said that it's very important to involve the parents? And I said, yes, Jack. Parents are our primary stakeholders. So they're going to want to play with their kids. And that's why when you pass the Autism Center on campus, you see a lot of play. But what do the kids want to play with? They want to play with really fun items. So I almost brought this in, but I decided someone's going to steal it. It's just too much fun. They're having so much fun, and we are now beginning to take happiness measures on how happy our kids are when they're learning. And it's actually being met with mixed response. Some of my colleagues are saying, yeah, great, finally. And other colleagues are saying, we don't care if the kids are happy. Yeah, we don't like those colleagues. <laughs> so I'm going to show you, oh, I brought some toys for you to see. I'm going to throw them. <laughs> you guys have to bring them back. This is a fun one. So if you make your treatment more motivating, and then of course there's bubbles. I don't know, Caitlin, you want to come and blow some bubbles in the app? <laughs> for some people. Kids are going to talk for these, OK? I have magnets, just a few. Kids are going to talk for those. They're not going to talk for boring items. OK, really quickly, you're going to see this little girl, Emmy. She did not speak very much. And she has a dual diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder and ADHD with a capital H. We could only get her to speak if we have those highly motivating toys. Oh, yeah. Let's see. My turn. Ready? Ready? The worm stretches. The worm stretches. The worm stretches. Here, let's sit on, you can sit on the chair on the floor. The worm stretches. Whoa. My turn. So she said a number of different phrases. The worm, the worm stretches, the worm crawls. So that's quite a variety of different um, sentences. We talked about our stakeholders being parents. And uh, they are the most important. And we need to train them because they will be with the kids for the longest time. We need to find a way that we can create uh, treatments that are going to be endorsed and follow through with the parents. Now, currently at the Autism Center, we have a number of parents who um, are bilingual or multilingual. And so we are now providing our treatment with the parents in other languages. Um, we don't always speak other languages, but we can find people who do. And um, here's an example 
of our eight-step natural language paradigm, which is something that you just saw in Emmy, but it's a lot more structured than that. In English, in Korean, many of you can read that. None of us can. And in Sp Spanish. So we are tra uh, training our Korean parents and our Spanish-speaking parents to provide that. Here's Brian again. He came in and said something to me in Korean the other day and started cracking up. So I'm not sure exactly what it was. Bear. Okay, I'm going to stop because we're running out of time. Here's some data from that study. It's a very complicated design. I'm not going to take you through every little thing. Oops, sorry. Here we go. Here's the baseline. We take baseline in English and in the heritage language. For Brian, it's Korean. For Sarah, it's Spanish. And then we provide, we have to teach the parents, in this case, as per the family, for Sarah, we um, train grandma, because grandma's the primary caretaker. And here's Brian and his mom. So we trained NLP in English, and then we do probes in both languages and in other settings. And as you can see, from NLP alone, we have quite a learning effect. And now we're comparing um, the performance in both heritage language and uh, English. The final way we can bridge the gap, well, there are many other ways, I'm just providing three right now, um, between science and service is choosing targets that have real world significance. And uh, each one of these are a little bit more complicated. Am I in your way? Um, first of all, we want to use age reference targets. We want to look at what neurotypical kids do. So um, we want to teach them certain behaviors that neurotypical kids will do. So for example, you may see us out on the field uh, playing football, not football, playing, um, although we did play flag football or touch football one day. That was a disaster. Um, kickball, wiffle ball, and other games so that hopefully they will be able to be moved along into a sports team after school. We want to integrate them with neurotypical kids. We want to do, um, teach behaviors that will reduce stigma. That's why we want to use cell phones and not whiteboards. Um, and social skills are very important. Now that the autism cohort is aging. Um, we have some high functioning persons or I have many kids who started with me 35 years ago when they were five and where are they now? We keep follow up data on them and we bring them back and we are seeing, of course we didn't have the treatment packages that we have now, but we are learning that even though they may be brilliant or they may have been responsive to treatment, they're having trouble retaining employment because of uh, social issues. They don't understand how they are supposed to behave in certain situations. So we have to make sure that we know uh, what is going on out there in the real world. And finally, and I think we do this pretty well, we disseminate what we learn but we do need to make sure we get it to the right people. We bring our work to conferences, we publish our work, and we also train providers 
I have a lot of CMC students who end up becoming psychologists, teachers, therapists, um, and helping spread the word to improve the lives of children with autism. I would like to thank Claremont McKenna College for their 35 years of support and might as well thank the Starks for hiring me in the first place um, many, many, many years ago. Um, I would like to thank the Leon Strauss Foundation and more recently uh, Simon Strauss Foundation for their support and the space. I'd like to thank my wonderful research assistants from the Claremont Colleges and uh, Claremont Graduate University who have made a tremendous scientific impact to the field. And of course, I'd like to thank, I'm not gonna point the red pointer at you guys, my uh, students who participate in the Autism Center on a regular basis who do not know how much of a difference they make in the lives of these children. Thank you. We have, what, five minutes for questions? Eight minutes for questions? No questions? There's a question, there's a question. People may be wanting to go to their 115 class. How do you, how do you select children to participate in your program? Um, from any referral source. We have a variety of referral sources. The regional centers of California for the developmentally disabled, from teachers, we have a lot from word of mouth from other parents. Some of them actually find us from our pathetic web page that we have. Hi, uh, first of all, thank you for giving your talk. I'm only really familiar with like more DIR floor time stuff, so I was really appreciative of being able to have like more of a behavioral standpoint. Um, and I was wondering, you spoke a lot about how uh, you obviously have some multilingual children. Have you had a lot of children who maybe speak, or who maybe sign as well as a spoken language? Or do I'm you- I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part. Sign language? Yeah. Okay. Um, do we use sign language in the clinic? Is that the question? Yeah, like do you have any children who you've worked with who maybe communicate in sign or for whom that seems to be their primary mode of communication? Okay, so the question is about sign language. And some of the kids are taught signs but not sign language uh, in school. We do not endorse sign um, or signing and that's because of several reasons. First of all, uh, the children generally do not learn sign language. It's a complicated language. And oftentimes they do not learn the actual sign. They learn their own way of signing. And usually um, they will learn a generic sign for a lot of different things like what is this, please? I think this is, oh, this is please? This is more. So they may learn more, and that may be uh, indicative of anything, like more juice, more water, more play, more what. So it doesn't really tell their parent or their teacher or their therapist what they want. So we believe that it's much more important for them to be able to speak exactly what they want. Also, there's a, there's a limit as to who will understand that particular sign and who understands sign. Whereas if a child gives you this sentence strip, or even in the beginning, this picture, you know exactly what they're communicating. Also with these, some of the, um, fast food restaurants, which they love, such as McDonald's. I don't know about Chick-fil-A, but Chick-fil-A is now high on their list. Um, some of them have menus where they can just point to what they want. And this is so self-sufficient 
They know what they want and they can order in a restaurant. So we do not teach sign. Yeah, we prefer picture. And our literature, our research, and it has been replicated with others that when you teach this, this is true with sign too though, uh, verbal speech comes in about 60% of our kids. Another question. Jill. Thank you. We had a CMC student, Bruno, who was an Athenaeum fellow and who had autism. There was a great big uh, amount of publicity about him. Um, did he ever come to your center? Or did you ever talk to him? He was the graduate student graduation speaker this year. So did you know he was here? No. Um, I didn't know anything about Bruno. I am sure there are some people in this room right now who may have a diagnosis of autism. I, am, I have had uh, students in my classes who have had autism. I, had, I have had students who have been in my clinic who have had autism. Uh, as I said earlier in my presentation, it's a huge spectrum. And some individuals with autism are uh, so unlikely to demonstrate their characteristics and it would be very, very difficult for lay persons to even notice, I would say. There used to be a category in the diagnostic statistical um, uh, DSM uh, in which uh, it used to be autism residual type. It, and that would be for those individuals who have no longer demonstrating any significant indicators of autism. But they took that out and they just made it a very wide spectrum. Now people speculate that Bill Gates is on the spectrum. And I don't think that's appropriate because he does not have a diagnosis. They just think he's quirky. There are a lot of people who are really, really quirky and are not, do not, you know, you don't deem them the diagnosis of a, on the spectrum. You just call them quirky. Any other questions? There's Hi. one in the back. Hi, thank you so much for speaking to us. I just was inquiring. Could you speak of, louder, please? Yeah, for sure. So I just wanted to thank you for coming to speak. I also was so fascinated by this inclusion of technology, um, mostly because I don't think there are many studies out there pro like proposing that technology is actually not an evil and can be a very educational tool. I was wondering if you could speak to a little bit the dependency that the children end up having on technology and their cell phones and their iPads, what have you. Um, what are the long-term effects of that? Okay, um, I have an interpreter because uh, you're speaking very rapidly and I don't have, oh, I can't. Well, the teachers could, your kids get dependent on technology and they can get that. Yeah, so um, we don't just give them a free-for-all in technology. So um, this particular study that I mentioned was just using the cell phone for a very specific means. In general, we do not hand out an iPad and say, have it. And in fact, in my opinion, this is a problem with children in general. And that um, it's, and the phones as well. Um, parents, it's the new babysitter of the millennial. Basically, parents give cell phones and iPads to children and they will sit in front of it hours and hours and hours. There was a news item about a camp in, I'm thinking Korea or Japan. I'm sorry, I, I'm misremembering it. They, it's like an addiction camp for middle schoolers and high schoolers where you send your kid to be, um, to go through withdrawal from your cell phone. And they highlighted one girl who was a middle schooler did not have a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder to have her go through detox and withdrawal from the cell phone. So we don't have a lot of technology. And since I've been here 35 years, 
Back in the day, when we did the first video modeling study, we used a huge camcorder and plugged in a VHS to a video camera and they watched on TV. Um, we don't really have that. To teach social skills, you have to be with another person. And that is the focus of what we do at the Autism Center. Any other questions? No, Sari? No, just rubbing your hands. Okay, I thank you very much. Oh, I need those toys back, by the way, especially the puff balls. Daniel, there's a pink one out there too, Leah.